when we look at this era, the real contemporary of Sandel was, of course, George Hackenschmidt. Probably the strongest man was Louis Cyr from Canada. Louis Hapolo Henry is so a massive icon in sports in France. And Sandwina's case, and we have people's remembrances about how she struck them. He empowered people to look after their bodies, get fit, improve their mind, and change their lives, and that's a great gift. I think all of these strength legends have this desire to express themselves physically, presenting their muscularity and their strength in creative ways. The fact that they were not just competing on a standard barbell meant that they had to find ways to demonstrate strength that the public could identify with and that at the same time they could marvel at. He was very modern in his exploitation of lighting. He had a posing box in order to show himself off. Well, we are all trying to invent new kinds of movement activities. But we have such a fantastic, rich history where we can draw from that can inspire us in harmonic proportions. Certain people have magic, and certain people can communicate and touch others in the audience. And I think that's what Sando had. He had this uncanny ability to connect with people. My favorite thing is that he gave the individual the courage to uh, improve themselves. He, he was an empowerment person. He gave people the confidence to take on board the exercises and make something of their lives. I think Sandow is considered a legend because he changed thinking about physical development entirely. He was a real celebrity at the time. He was um, George V's own physical instructor, which was pretty amazing if you think like that. He, he knew the great celebrities of the day. He knew Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote you know, Sherlock Holmes. He had an appeal which was you know, almost literally universal. Wherever you were in the world, from India to Australia to America to Germany and France, people responded to him. My name is David Waller. I've written about five books. Three of them have been about Victorian people that have been forgotten. And Eugene Sandow was one of them. He offered this promise, you too could be like me. You too could make yourself perfect through discipline, through exercise, through physical culture. And that just chimed in perfectly with the needs, the concerns, the anxieties of the era. Sando, with his physical beauty, for many years he was held up as the ideal of human perfection. But of course, if someone invented the six-pack, it was Mr. Sando. He was very proportionally built. Unlike a lot of the strong men who worked in this era, he was not 250 pounds. He wasn't like Louis Cyr, the sort of the big, beefy, kind of Clydesdale of a strong man. He was not particularly tall, about 5'8", normally weighed, I think, about 185 pounds. So he was not an overly large man. But what made him really unique was his physique. He looked like you or me. He looked like an ordinary man of the late 19th century, and yet rip off his clothes and he would suddenly turn into this extraordinary strong figure. He had this incredible muscled body and, and people were in awe of that. He didn't have the kind of classic broad-shouldered bodybuilding physique that we're so familiar with now because the kind of stuff that he did and in fact that all trainers did involved more just single attempt lifts and doing feats. That's what captivated the public. If you were going to do a stage show, that's what people would want to see. One of the very first films that Thomas Edison made, or anyone ever made, it shows Sandow. That was, to some degree, a testament to his fame. Sandow was born, Friedrich Mueller, in East Prussia in 1867, so only two years after our Civil War. 
Terry had written his doctoral dissertation on the history of American weightlifting, and he was like Mr. Walking Encyclopedia of weightlifting. He was an adventurous young man and very active, you know, loved to play and run and jump and tumble. Like a lot of young men in the late 1800s, he began to understand that there was the chance to have some kind of career in showmanship. So when we think about the world of performance and the, and the idea of like doing something with our bodies physically, most of us now tend to think that, well, we should be sportsmen. We should be, we should be athletes of some kinds and because we have competitive sports. But you have to remember that at the end of the 19th century, which was Sandow's era, there wasn't really a world of competitive sport like that. But what changed his life was when he made his way somehow to Brussels, where he first met Louis Attila. And Sandow, by this time, was trying to make a name for himself as a strong man and as a, as a performer. He could see, and others could see, that he had real talent. So came time to choose a name. He took the name Sandow. And there has been, among Sandow followers for years, there was a lot of argument about, well, where did he get that name? Where did that come from? Is that some classic reference? And I guess there are a lot of different theories, but finally someone maybe noticed or maybe looked up to see what his mother's maiden name was. And it was Sandov, S-A-N-D-O-V. And so he simply changed that one last letter and became Sandow. This is the article I did uh, about the lion fight David Chapman wrote the uh, best, most thorough book, the definitive book, about Sandow. In 1887, 1888, Sandow was apparently in uh, dire financial straits. And if you are a young, good-looking man, uh, there are a couple of ways that you can remedy that situation, and one of them is to offer yourself as an artist's model. He was in Belgium. He posed for a number of of figures at this time. The artists have reinterpreted Sandow's body and physique. And one, he is uh, being, uh, Satan being trampled by Saint Michael. And another, he is a centaur who is fighting one of the Greeks. And in another, he is trying to rob an eagle's nest. savoir que les, les musées royaux des beaux-arts de Belgique ont une existence de plus de 200 ans et a été créé au départ avec un noyau de collection euh, quand euh, Bonaparte a créé ici un musée départemental. Ensuite, ça, ben, les collections ont augmenté. Nous sommes un musée euh, varié avec de la sculpture, des dessins, des peintures, même des archives bien entendu. Je suis Véronique Cardon, je travaille pour les archives, notamment dans un centre d'archives, les archives de l'art contemporain en Belgique, sur l'art qui va du 19e à nos jours. Pour cette sculpture, c'est Sando qui, aurait, euh, qui dit lui-même avoir euh, été modèle. Il voyageait beaucoup et donc, comme vous savez, il s'est arrêté en Anvers et euh, voilà, il a rencontré Jeff Lambeau. Ça a tout de suite euh, servi à, cette, à réaliser cette, cette sculpture. Et apparemment même, on dirait que l'aigle avait même blessé légèrement le modèle. C'était une activité que vous avez kind of sauvée pour quand vous étiez desperate. Apparemment, vous uh, n'avez pas payé très much et vous n'avez pas much de respect. He did this until he could become more successful. Early on, he would find these places that had strength machines. Using the instructions that were listed, uh, he found that he was able to break the handle. It's never been revealed that anyone else told him to do this. Perhaps they did, but he realized the value. And so he went around late in the evenings to all the ones in this city and he broke them. And this, of course, everybody had to know, well, who in the world was breaking those machines? And finally, he was apprehended by the police who um, didn't really believe that he could, he was capable of such strength. And so he did some impromptu tests of strength. 
He took the instructions, showed the instructions to them. They got another machine using the instructions that were given by the manufacturer. He broke the machine. So he was not only not thrown in the slammer, but he also got a great deal of local publicity. It was probably, if it happened at all, it was probably a publicity stunt because he was appearing at a local theater and this was probably to drum up some interest in his, uh, in his abilities so that there would be more people who came to his performances. So. It's a great story because it's what every strong man needs, which is how do you put yourself forward? How do you first get in the public's eye? And, and so a lot of them in the last part of the 19th century would find ways to do these extraordinary feats to sort of gain that notoriety. Attila learned that two men were appearing in London. Charles Sampson, he spelled it with a P, and another man who went by the name Cyclops. Cyclops specialized in lifting heavy weights, and uh, Sampson specialized in feats of hand strength, wrist strength. They were appearing nightly at one of the big halls in London and offering quite a bit of money to anyone who could match their feats. And sometimes, every now and again, someone from the audience would take up the challenge. That night, it was Sandow, much to the sadness of those two other men. Sandow, when he got up wearing a dinner suit and he looked just like a, an ordinary bloke, people laughed at him, but this was part of his act. He just ripped it off and all of a sudden he had this incredible muscled uh, body and, and people were in awe of that. But it was a special set of evening clothes with, uh, that was just kind of lightly sewn together. And so when he jumped on stage and uh, offered to perform the same tricks, uh, Samson looked at him and started laughing. He says, you're going to do this? And then at that point, Sando ripped off his evening clothes and there he was in his stage costume as a strong man uh, with his Roman sandals and uh, his, his jersey, his tight jersey, and everyone kind of gasped and, and stepped back. So that's the kind of, uh, of showmanship that he was a master of. He lifted the weights, all the weights that Samson could lift. There were four different feats that Samson did with barbells. Sandow matched every one. The crowd went crazy, as you can imagine. It was the rage of the trickster tricked. He was a very volatile character, Samson was, and so he started screaming and running around and saying, this isn't fair, this isn't fair. Sando couldn't speak English very well at that point, so he was relying on Attila to translate for him. Um, but he immediately won the sympathy of the audience, and, and that, was, that was how it all started. If you don't have the sympathy of the audience, you're, you're done for as an entertainer. Essentially, it was very much um, akin to a modern reality TV show where you essentially come on and display your talents and you win popular acclaim. And he won this uh, trial of strength under somewhat dubious circumstances. Undoubtedly, there was trickery on all sides, but that made it fun. And then, as you know, after that, he became almost an overnight celebrity. That one thing elevated him so that he never really lost his fame after that one glorious moment when he leapt to the stage of the Alhambra Theater. He was a superb showman. Often in his performances, he would assume what was called the Tomb of Hercules position. And this is where he would put his arms back and his legs out in front of him um, and form a kind of platform. And then assistants would put a plank over his body as he was in this Tomb of Hercules position. And horses would ride up and down over his body. And by having a horse in the act, he was showing that he was strong enough to lift a horse and to support a horse. 
I was the first woman to total 1,000 pounds, the first woman to total 1,100 pounds, the first woman to total 1,200 pounds. I'm a competitive person. And doing the light stuff, like just going to the gym and like whatever I was supposed to be doing, which was unclear, wasn't really compelling. But the idea of like lifting something heavy, that was interesting. Sandow had to find ways to demonstrate strength that the public could identify with and that at the same time they could marvel at. We're in the heart of London where Eugene Sandow used to live when he was here. Remember, this was Victorian and Edwardian times. A house like this was for the, really the top class. You're, you're talking as high as you can get, far beyond actors and actresses. And it just shows you the regard in which he's held now. I'm David Webster, traveled all over the world for sports, and I became the first strength coach in uh, Scotland. Sandow was known throughout the world because he did travel a great deal in America. Uh, he wrestled a lion, but Sandow said, we must cover its claws and make sure that it can't bite me, you know? So they did that, and the lion seemed to be quite comfortable with it. And then Sandow said, I'll have to try it out in advance, you know, let me get a, a little shot at this just to see what it's going to do, how it reacts and so on. So they had a, a bout and oh, it was ferocious and, you know, knocked him about a bit, but he, he went back and gave it a great match. And then uh, came the match, they both get into the ring, but when Sandow went over to the animal, it backed off and it didn't want to let him wrestle. So he had to get into it and make it wrestle, you know, and so they got about it, but the, it was never like it was the first time and it wasn't nearly so uh, ferocious as it was the first time. This is the heroic version of the lion fight. <laughs> this is how they hoped it would be, but it wasn't. Sando fighting the lion, and the, the fight is, of course, in quotes, and it shows poor Commodore the lion bolted down to the stage with his mittens and muzzle, and there's Sando twisting his tail. And there, someone has thrown a bouquet there that says, for bravery. <laughs> Ironical, isn't it? So he realized that, like most other performers, you have to move around a bit and perform here, perform there, and then by the time you come back, maybe to London or back to New York City, people will remember and they'll go see you again. One of the showiest things he did in this act, he had a, a marvelous feat with a pony. Sometimes the drawings advertising his show showed it as a full-sized horse, even so. It was a big live pony. They would backstage lift it with a block and tackle. He would then step back to the edge of the curtain and, and he would reach up and grasp a rope that was attached to kind of a, a harness that went under the pony. And he would straighten his arm over his head and grasp that and then he would take the weight of the pony across his shoulders and his upper back and he would lean slightly forward but holding the pony in place with that one hand, he would then walk out and walk across the stage. He really was holding it with one hand, but he got the advantage of being able to have it lifted in place by a mechanism. He did this often. This, this usually caused terrific applause from the audience when he would do it. Sandow very cleverly and always adapted his performances to meet the needs, the mood of the time. And so in his show, he dressed up as a, as a soldier um, who was being chased by the Boers and um, reached a ravine. Uh, he was being followed by some women and children um, who were terrified at the prospect of uh, being uh, caught up by, by, the, by the enemy. And the only way across the ravine was for Sandow to build a, a human bridge. So he turned himself into a bridge over which the party of children, women, civilians, plus cannons, horses, and everything would be carried. And uh, that, was, that was his act. So it was designed to show quite literally how he could support the empire. 
It's kind of heavy and bulky. Ugh. I am not a strong man, so I can't do this like Sando could. Now this is a, an original stained glass window. This is Sando the performer right here. This would be leopard skin uh, and uh, of course the leather sandals. It was just a common thing for, uh, for strongmen in that day to, to wear leopard skins. Here is a person who is in touch with his primal, primitive soul and like the, um, like the warriors of old, he could, he could tear wild beasts apart and, and put on their fur for clothing, things of that sort. So yeah, I think that's pretty ridiculous to modernize, but that was, that was how people did things. Arnold Schwarzenegger is, a, is an obvious individual who has come out many times and said that Sandow was a great influence on his early life. Physically, Arnold and Sandow would look very, very different standing next to one another. Arnold was so much taller, but Arnold would be challenged beyond imagination uh, to follow Sandow in the kind of show that he could put on. He just wouldn't be able to do some of the things that Sandow could do because, again, Sandow was a performing strongman. He learned from people like Professor Attila. He learned how to, how to carry that pony. I think the moment where he changed from being just another strongman to becoming the Sandow was really when he hooked up with Flo Ziegfeld. Because it was Ziegfeld, as I understand it, who was the person who suggested to him that in addition to doing the kind of feats of strength things, which so many of the men did, that he should also display his body. And so his stage act changed under Ziegfeld's direction. And so they created a sort of a cabinet thing where there was a sort of black curtain behind him and then he would come out and disrobe and pose. That was the thing that clearly differentiated him, was that he moved from just being the guy who could lift the pony or he could lift the barbell to doing these other kinds of things. And it worked because he would powder himself white, so he sometimes looked like a statue, and they were much smarter about lighting. That was a big moment for him. He was very modern in his exploitation of lighting. He had a posing box in order to show himself off. And people, you know, it sounds somehow unappealing, but it really did resonate with the audiences of the time. His charisma and personality took control of almost every country in the world. They'd all heard of him. He empowered people to look after their bodies, get fit, improve their mind, and change their lives, and that's a great gift. Sando wasn't just a strong man. He was a, a living god, I guess you could say. He was a physique star, not a, a weightlifter. And so he was aiming for more sophisticated effects, I think you could say. He wanted to show his finesse. He wanted to show his fineness. He wanted to show his artistry. It was about kind of putting the human body up on a pedestal and showing it as something kind of more than what, what Victorian Britain or the Victorian world thought of the body. And it's about changing kind of ideas about what the human body could be. But the way he was built, people were fascinated by his perfect proportion. He wasn't particularly tall, and he wasn't particularly big and bulky either, but he was able to be very strong and to show the potential of his strength. Uh, and they talked about his muscles rippling like lianas, and you know, essentially when he put them into gear, they were extremely impressive. But under most circumstances, he just looked like a you know, relatively normal businessman. Here is one of the rarest posters of Sando. This is from the Trocadero vaudevilles. And as you can see, it's in really bad condition, but it's the best that I have. The thing about American posters is, unlike the Europeans who thought of posters as art, after they had done their job, Americans tended to think of posters as litter. And so they were torn down and thrown away. So the fact that this has survived, even in its terrible state, is pretty good. I don't think the Library of Congress even has this one. Also, we have some artistic remains 
of Sandow, and you can find them in statues uh, in the Brussels town hall and in the city. The Sandow sculpture is something very special because it's a kind of unique moment in 19th century, 20th century culture where the British Museum, that kind of the British people said, you know, we want to capture this moment. The idea that a living celebrity would have his body cast in bronze and then presented in the museum is something kind of amazing. I'm Willoughby Gerrish, I'm the head of modern and contemporary sculpture at Bowman Sculpture in London. To make the piece, to give you an idea of what they would have done, they would have got Sandow to stand and then put plaster on his body. But the really difficult thing for him, I, I suppose, would have been they wanted a tense body. So he would have had to tense all the way through as the plaster was, was drying. And the idea to keep your body tense for that long is, was apparently, according to him, as difficult as any of the, the physical kind of feats he did. So it took a month to do the casting. He came every day and sat for hours and it was done in five different pieces. So the arms and the legs and the head and then you could put all those pieces together and then take a bronze cast, and that's what we have here. In many ways, he was the first one to understand the connection between strength and health and entrepreneurship, if I can say it that way, that we could take this and inspire other people and use our stories to try to send the message to other folks that doing exercise will transform us. There were times even Sandow succumbed to the opportunity to make a lot of money. I mean, he came out with a set of Sandow dumbbells, very famous, the little wooden dumbbells, and you would squeeze them together. There was a small spring in each of the two dumbbells you would get, and when you squeezed the spring all the way shut, it would ring a little bell. And he had a system of program of exercises that went with that, that had you doing curls while squeezing this thing, or holdouts while squeezing it, or overhead presses. And of course, the only thing it exercised, and that would be damn little, because the springs were not that strong, would be the flexor muscles of your forearm. One of the aspects of his magazines that are, made them so popular with collectors is that a lot of the magazines had fold-out courses in them. This is Strength and How to Obtain It. It went into five editions, and it was basically the book that everyone bought if they wanted to do the Sandow exercises. It had the, the Sandow wall charts in the back. It had a place where you could write all your measurements down before and after. And it was his little red book. It was his little Bible. And everyone did the Sandow bodybuilding exercises. But it was a personal brand, and he opened the Institute of Physical Culture in the heart of the West End in St. James's Street, where you could come and make yourself perfect like him. So he offered personal tuition, and then he worked out that he could leverage his brand, as we say in modern parlance. He used the Sandow name to set up other schools under franchise, as it were, and then mail order courses, uh, where you could pursue the Sandow fitness regime wherever you were in the world. Hundreds of thousands of people followed that program. He held the first bodybuilding competition, a big one, at the Royal Albert Hall, and uh, he filled it up. This picture was probably taken 1901. That's when the great competition was. When you go to London, you'll see. It still looks pretty much the same today, but it doesn't have a poster of Sando out in front. It was hugely discussed and this added to his fame. They were wearing leotards, which seems quite risque by modern standards. And how did you get away with it at a time when it was a scandal if a woman showed her ankles? I mean, it really was a case of double standards. Again, I think an example of his great intelligence in understanding how to make this sort of display respectable. He began getting involved in different kinds of business ventures, which were basically um, what we would now call in modern management theory, he was branding himself. So there was Sandow's Cocoa, there were Sandow Needles, there were Sandow Cigars, but there were just all kinds of products that he lent his name to that demonstrate he wasn't just a circus guy. He was much, much more than that. He had more meaning. Sandow was on very firm ground for as long as it was about him, his physique, and physical culture. 
and he, he could lend his brand to a training system and to equipment that was directly relevant to that, uh, like the spring grip dumbbells. But he went one step too far. I think for him, uh, the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were, was moving into the food industry uh, and making uh, supplements, really, again, quite a modern idea, and making cocoa with his name on it. Uh, I think it would have been fine if he just let his brand be taken over by manufacturers, but in fact he went into the manufacturing, and that was a completely bad decision. He didn't know anything about manufacturing. The capital involved was enormous, and it involved a supply chain, which required to be on good terms with Germany. Well, guess what? We went to war with Germany. He couldn't get the raw materials anymore, and if he did, he could be accused of being a traitor. He was German, of course, German of origin, and so uh, things unraveled. He really faded into kind of obscurity. Santa, of course, married. Married her, I think, around 1894, 1895. However, there was something about that marriage that didn't quite work. He was getting older, his wife was struggling with their marriage, and really it didn't add up. He wasn't attending to things he should have been attending to, like his business affairs properly. He was living, he was living on tick, you know, I'm Sandar here, pay later. You know, that's what it was, the same in his personal life. Basically, when the Sandar's cocoa factory went bust, big style, that was a massive financial blow. I mean, it, it bankrupted him as good as. And then the war came. He was, um, as an alien, he was badly persecuted in the war. He had to lie low. As he aged, he took care of himself and he still looked wonderful later in life. There's some uh, photographs of him when he was near the very end of his life and he still looked very fit, very healthy. He did die at only 58, but we don't know for sure. Uh, after he did lift, apparently, a large car on one of his cars that ran off the road, he was trying to help ride it and help it get back in place, and he complained of uh, his head hurting when he got back home. But it was a, a little bit of time after that when he actually did die. So there's still some question about his death. Now, if people say, how can he lift a car out of a ditch? I'm quite certain that Eugene Sandow could. But Sandow was getting on now. And although he didn't have a heart attack or anything, it certainly did affect him. The cause of his death was probably not that he lifted a car out of a ditch, as so many people like to tell us. Um, we all would like to sort of write our stories, and strong men get to do that more than most. But at the end of his lifetime, the family his wife and daughter would not allow a monument to be erected on his grave. This is where sometimes you think it would be great to be a novelist because we just don't know what happened beyond the fact that he was eventually buried in an unmarked grave. And this is, this is a, a huge puzzle. It's a real insult to his memory. A man who was beloved by hundreds of thousands, one of the most famous people of, of the time, buried like that in an unmarked grave with no record of him, or who he was, his achievements. Clearly, he was estranged from his wife and his daughters. And there's a mystery around that. I mean, something happened that was really bad. And we just don't know what it was. There's a lot of speculation. He might have died of syphilis. He might have been homosexual or bisexual, which at the time, of course, would have been scandalous. We just don't know. But clearly, whatever happened was really bad, caused a major rupture with his loved ones. And when he died, he was not lamented by them. All the reports from those periods indicate that whenever people got together, and they did a number of times, they would approach the family one way or the other, but they simply never yielded. They never wanted to see him honored in that way. I think his actual cause of death on his death certificate, I believe it says aortic aneurysm, which could be from a lot of things. What we don't know is the real cause of death, and aortic aneurysm has in itself has many causes as an expression of a disease. And yes, of course, it, it, you know, one possible explanation is that he did exert himself too much in, in this incident with the, with the car, which I believe is true, that he did lift it up. We'll never know. I mean, that's one of the things about history there, that we're not going to find those records. But it was true that she did not allow a tombstone to be erected. She was not happy with him at the end of his life. Finally, I don't recall the exact date, but a very small marker 
was put up by some of his friends. Uh, maybe they thought it was so long, maybe they didn't even ask anyone other than the cemetery. But it was a very small little marker indicating this is where Sandow's remains are. Chris Davis is Eugene Sandow's great-grandson. My name's Chris Davis. I live in the Lake District, uh, northern England, and I'm the great-grandson of Eugene Sandow. And one of the things that he did was organize for a proper memorial to be established at Sandow's grave in Putney Vale. Since he is a member of the family, only the family can okay the erection of any monument. He found a large irregular stone in a quarry and he had the word Sando and uh, Sando's dates engraved on it. It's a good marker. It has the ruggedness and the strength that he wanted to convey from the character of his great-grandfather. And it's substantial. It acknowledges that Sandow is there, but it took a, not quite a hundred years, 80 years or so, before that was done. Sandow was so convinced of his own abilities and aware that he was a singular man, that he was extraordinary by this odd combination of unusual physical strength and also unusual physical beauty. He had quite a kind of a big effect on British kind of culture, but also apparently for training the army, his, his techniques were brought in to kind of train the army and that changed the way the army thought about training their soldiers, so quite an important person in terms of not just celebrity, but actually um, making a difference to kind of physical health in Britain. You know, he was a celebrity, but there was more to him than many celebrities of today. He had real substance. Uh, his substance was around how he could help you or I attain a degree of physical fitness. Let's not say physical perfection, but he offered out the hope that you could become better. And so I think he, he captured people's dreams and helped people fulfill those dreams to, to a great extent. That, I think, is more than, than many celebrity of today has achieved. And I've met endless people, and they've said to me, he was life-changing. He changed my whole life. Without Sandow, even today, my life would have been different. That is amazing. And I meet them all the time. Sandow, he, he takes us above ourselves. He, he brings us into a greater awareness that we, we maybe can do more things than we think we can. <laughs>